Well, this morning, I want to preach a message that I've entitled, True Repentance. Uh, true Repentance. And as we normally do, I'll ask you, if you will, just to stand, just in honor and reverence to the reading of His holy, inerrant, infallible Word. We'll take our text in Matthew chapter 3. We're going to read these verses here, the first 12 verses of chapter 3. Uh, Matthew writes like this. He says, In those days came John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness of Judea, and saying, Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. For this is he that was spoken by the prophet Isaiah, saying, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. And the same John had his raiment of camel's hair and a leathern girdle about his loins, and his meat was locusts and wild honey. Then went out to him Jerusalem and all Judea and all the region round about Jordan, and were baptized of him in, in Jordan, confessing their sins. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees come to his baptism, he said unto them, O generation of vipers, who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bring forth therefore fruits, meat for repentance. And think not to say within yourselves, We have Abraham our father. For I say unto you that God is able of these stones to raise up children unto Abraham. And now also the axe is laid unto the root of the trees. Therefore every tree that bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance. But he that cometh after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire, whose fan is in his hand, and he will thoroughly purge his floor and gather his wheat into the garner. But he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. Let's pray, Father, and amen. And you can be seated. How many times have you heard someone say when you would witness to them about going to church or uh, coming with you to church or whatever? I've heard people say, you know what, I'm just as good as those people down there. I really don't need uh, what you guys are propagating because I'm just as good as they are. You've also probably heard people say, well, I really don't feel right about going to church until I get my life right because I don't want to go to church and act like a hypocrite. I, I, want, to, I want to be living the Christian life and then, and then I'll go and, and, and be uh, in, in the church. You know, it's, it's kind of like that they're just kind of putting things off or, or whatever. But I'm reminded of a passage of scripture that Jesus spoke that really got my attention and still holds me today. It just grips my heart when I think of the passage of scripture that he, what he said in Matthew 7 in verses 13 and 14. Uh, Jesus said to us, he said, enter into straight gate because straight is the gate and narrow the way that leads to heaven. And he says, few there be that find it. And I, I look at that and I think, Lord, compared to the billions of people that's been on the earth, there's only a few people gonna find this gate that leads to heaven. And we understand and know that that gate is the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's not very popular in our, our culture today. Because since the age of enlightenment, men has got smarter and they, they know more and all that, it seems that they've just looking, they're bypassing the word of God and they don't take into consideration the established word that God has given us. And this book, by the way, has been tested over time and it, it stood the test of time and, it'll, and, and it's gonna be fulfilled just like it's been spoken by the prophets. This word is going to come to pass and is coming to pass and God is able to help us see and understand that. But you see, there's something that we wanna understand this morning and I hope that we can, I hope we can do that. Today, I want us to consider what true repentance really is according to the Bible. What is true repentance? What does it mean to really be a repentant and, and, and to repent of sin? Well, just in the way of helping us understand what repentance is, I first of all want to tell you what it's not, although it's, it's, it could be part of it. Repentance is not just this sorry feeling about 
what my sins. I've seen people come down the aisle weeping and real, and, they're, and they look sorrowful for the sins and they probably are sorrowful for some sins. But see, that is just that. It's, it's, it's a feeling of feeling guilty and feeling sorry for their sins. That is not repentance. That, that can be part of it, but that's not true repentance. Um, you see, true repentance works like this. True repentance is, is kind of, true repentance is an action word. It requires you to do something. And the word repent means basically in, in the original language, it means to change. It means, it means that I've basically had a change of mind. So to repent is I've changed my mind about me and about who God is and all that and I'm now I'm placing myself in agreement with God. And so basically repentance is a change of mind so that I can come into and receive this great gospel that the Lord Jesus Christ came to the earth for us to help us understand. So when, when we understand, when we understand this great and mighty gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, he is our heart and changes our life. Amen. I can never thank you enough for what you did for me. Amen. I love you so much. Amen. You died for my sins. Once you took away my broken heart, you filled me with your spirit. I can never thank you enough for that. Lord, I just want to Amen. Whatever I do, that's my life. I always shine for you. No matter what I do. Hallelujah. Lord, I can't live with the privilege of coming to church. I feel so unworthy, Lord, of your love. But you died on the cross for me and everybody. And I'm just so thankful for your unchanging hands. I hope you have. Amen. It's in God's not fixed. Lord, I thank you for my word. Your word and your promises. Lord, I live by. Lord, I want to always serve you to the best of my ability. I can only glorify your name and you think I do today. I love you and I praise you. Amen. You are holy and holy. I'm so unworthy, but God, you took me. And you call my name. Thank you, God, you call my name one day. Amen. I died going to hell, but you call my name that day. You changed me, Lord. You gave me a different person. And I have a heart of love now for everybody that's lost. God, I pray that you'll give me the gift of your love. And I pray that you'll forgive me of my sins. Lord, I pray that you'll give me the gift of your love. And I pray that you'll give me the gift of your love. And I pray that you'll give me the gift of your love. And I pray that you'll give me the gift of your love. And I pray that you'll give me the gift of your heart. Give me a heart of love like you give me. I love you and praise the Holy Man. And everything I do. Amen. Amen. Church, I want you to know that you have the freedom to obey God in this congregation. When God moves on your heart, you speak. One thing I give you is that liberty. The Bible tells me that where the Spirit of God is, there's liberty. And I want you to understand there's liberty here because the Spirit of God definitely moves in our heart and life. You know, the world can't understand that. The reason why is because they've never understood true repentance. They know not what true repentance is. If you were to leave from Elizabethan, California, and let's say I was in California and I called you and I, I said, you know, brother, how about, how about you come to California? I wouldn't tell you to leave Elizabethan because it would be understood in order to get to California, I can't stay in Elizabeth and I have to go to California, so therefore I got to leave Elizabeth and to get to California. And so that's the way it is with repentance. If I'm going into the kingdom of heaven, I can't stay in my old sinful life and in my old self life. I've got to come out of it, I've got to repent, I've got to turn from it. See, repentance is like going to the road and make you turn, you're coming the other way. And repentance is an action word. It's not a feeling word. Now, sure, we feel bad about our sin. I get sometimes broken. I remember one time in particular, I was in the shower. Now, this is an odd place for this to happen. But I get to thinking about my terrible sins in, in the past and what it cost Jesus. And I saw the Lord Jesus on the cross of Calvary there, bloody and beaten for me. I happened to realize that was my sin there. I deserve that. And I tell you, I... 
broke down and began to weep in the shower simply because I realized that I put Jesus on the cross. My sin put him there. And that caused a great sense of, of, of sorrow in my heart. But now if I had come out of that shower and went right back into my old wicked ways or whatever, continued in my wicked ways, there would have been no repentance. There would have been a sorrowful thing, but there would have been no repentance. There would have been no turning around. And John here is preaching the baptism of repentance. And I believe there's a great lesson in this we can see. There's four points I wanna show you that I think will help us understand what true repentance is. And the first point I wanna show you in this message here this morning is that there is a, an expectation. There's a great expectation in Israel. Notice with me in verse two. And, and he says in verse two, he says, repent ye for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. The Jewish people understood that there in prophecy there is a Messiah coming, the deliverer coming for Israel. And what they failed to understand, they were seeing a natural kingdom. But what God has explained, he has explained that I am redeeming mankind to myself and I'm going to create a new heaven and a new earth and here's where my church is going, here's where the people is going to be that I'm going to have fellowship and relationship through all the endless ages of eternity. But the people of Israel was looking for it to happen then, right now is what they were thinking. They, they were looking for it to take place then. And you, so, so you see, there was a great expectation of this event coming from Israel because they had been under the rule of the Greeks and then they had also been under the rule of the Roman Caesars. And they were looking for somebody to free them. They wanted somebody, anybody coming. So they were expecting this deliverer to come. They were acting, the Pharisees was actually looking for Messiah to come. And so now, between chapter two and chapter three of Matthew, approximately 28 years passes. And, but I want you to know also, but between the, the last book of the Old Testament, which is tied to Matthew, there was a period of 400 years that's called the silent years. No prophet of God spoke. In other words, the word of God was silent. It was almost as if they were in total bondage and captivity because they had been given the law and, and uh, the law of Moses and they were living and here you had, we had the Pharisees making laws, making them up as they went along really. And so they had got into, into a religious mess, so to speak. And then here we find John the Baptist showing up. And if you remember him, the angel Gabriel came and told Zechariah that he was gonna, they were gonna bear a son, that Liv was gonna have him even in her old age. And so this was the John the Baptist that was raised up. Remember the angel said, call him John, because he was actually the last prophet of the Old Testament. Here he is, he, now he is, he's begun his ministry and out there, and I can imagine, he didn't look very popular. He wasn't real slick, he wasn't a city slicker. Now this old boy, he, he, he was something else. He had camel's hair, he had a leather girl around him and, and he ate grasshoppers and wild honey. And you can imagine this old boy having locust legs hanging out of his mouth, so to speak. He wasn't very pretty to look at. But he had a message, and the people were listening to him. The reason why is because, you know, he's talking about this, the kingdom as heaven is at hand. It's getting ready to happen, you know. This, this deliverer's coming, let's go hear what he's got to say. So you see, there was an expectation in the life. I tell you, I think in the world today, if people could understand and see the true light of the Lord Jesus Christ, there would be a great expectation. Because church, I'm telling you, there is a deliverer for mankind. He is present in spirit, and he is moving in a mighty way, drawing those people to himself that belong to him, who are his. Not only in expectation, I want you to notice also the mass movement. Now notice in verse five with me, notice the mass movement that was here. The Bible says, then went out to him Jerusalem, and all Judea, and all the region round about, around about Jordan. In other words, all the known religions at that time began to come together. Now why were they kind of walking out to hear this message that John the Baptist was preaching? Because somebody had been telling the word of the Lord has come. The word of the Lord has come. Now, I want you to notice back in, uh, back here in, in, in verse one, it says, it says that in those days came John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness of Judea. Here's what he was preaching. God had put with him a burden to give this message. 
I don't think John really wanted to, I don't think John, John didn't find himself in the seminary learning how to do this. As a matter of fact, John probably would be let alone. But there was something in his heart that compelled him, would not let him rest. I need to, here's what, here's the word of the Lord has come, and here's what the word of the Lord is. See, Israel had not heard the word of the Lord from a prophet for 400 years. So now it was very important to these people. It got their attention. Here's John speaking now the word. And so they came to hear. See, they came to listen to this message. And that message was simply this. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Now let's talk just a little bit about the baptism. John was baptizing them, putting them in water. That was a, a custom that they did in the Jewish faith when there was a proselyte, some Gentile or some person who didn't, wasn't of the Jewish faith, wanted to come in and be a Jew. What they would do would be to baptize a person which represent a, a, a ceremonial cleansing and, and then they would circumcise the males and they, then they, they would be a proselyte. They, would, they wasn't Jew by birth, but then they would come into the Jewish faith and be, and be a Jew. So here's what was being said. When they came, here came Jerusalem and Judea and all around Jordan came to them. What they were doing, they were calling, John was calling the Jewish people back to God because they had gotten so far away from God. They had drifted in their activity or whatever and they hadn't heard a word from the Lord for 400 years. They were just had drifted away from God. And so John said, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Now I will admit to you, and the scripture bears it out, that what the prophet, what the, the prophet John, John the Baptist was showing, he was seeing the kingdom of God coming right on through into the, into the celestial kingdom. He didn't realize at that time that there was gonna be a lot of time between each of these valleys, so to speak, as far as time concerned. John didn't recognize that there was gonna be 2,000 years or more between the time Jesus died on the cross until he returned in that triumphal return, his second advent here on this earth. John didn't show us that. He just simply showed us that the kingdom of heaven is at hand, that God's gonna do what he said he's gonna do. And that's the way with a lot of prophets. The prophet Isaiah, Zechariah, and those guys who prophesied in Daniel, they, they show you the high points. They really don't get down and give you a timeline until you really study into it and, and figure out the timeline that's concerned here, but John was showing that the kingdom of heaven was a hand, which caused a mass movement. Now, when they came out, they came out to listen to and to hear this great man of God. The Bible tells us there's not a greater man ever born of woman than John the Baptist. John the Baptist was the greatest ever born according, according to the scripture. Now then, we also can look at another point I wanna show you, and that is the demands for repentance. What does it really take to repent? Because really religious people in a sense. But see, there was, there was some demands that, that we can see here. Look in verses seven through eight. He says, but when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees come to his baptism, he said unto them, O generation of vipers, who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come. Now let's focus on that just the Pharisees and the Sadducees were the religious order of the Jewish family and the Jewish culture of that day. They were the priests and the preachers and they were the, all, all that combined. And, and John said, oh, listen, you bunch of snakes. The reason why he was caught to them like that, he knew God was not their father. He knew they were not right with God. So therefore, all them, you, you, you vipers, you're, you're just, that's who you are. You're just a bunch of vipers. And I'm gonna tell you something, there are some people out there in the religious kingdom today who we could say the same thing to. Who's warned you to come and try to get right with God because you're, you're not right with God, you don't even belong to God. And see, John was putting an accusation against these people. Now the Pharisees were religious order. Uh, at this particular time, I think, uh, according to Josephus, there was probably about 6,000 right there in Jerusalem around about that was kind of in control of stuff in the religious order. And, and the Pharisees, uh, they believed in, 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 uh, in certain things that even we believe in today, they believed in uh, living right and having a good outward appearance and all that. Uh, they believed in, in, in good works, they, they believed that. 
But you see, they also made up some rules as they went along. They, they just, in other words, whatever seemed right to them is what they did. They, they, they wanted to believe in what the Old Testament said plus whatever oral traditions that come along. So they kind of had, they, they were very strict. They were strict to the people. They wanted to appear pie in front of the people. But see, inside they were, they, they were, they were like dead men's bones. They were, they were deceitful and they were, they were just putting on show in front of people, but there was no love for God. There was no truth in them. There was no spirit. The reason, and you see, he warned and said, you vipers, who, who, who warned you to flee? And the Sadducees, and I've often heard it said that the reason they were named Sadducees is because they believed in just the written, the written word, whatever the law said in the written word, they did not believe in resurrection. They, uh, the, the word Sadducees actually in, interpreted means the righteous. Uh, they, they, they believed in, in the, um, uh, they didn't believe in the immortality of the soul. They didn't believe in the existence of spirits and angels. They didn't believe in, 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 in divine predestination, uh, or the free will of man, those type of things. And I've heard it said the reason they were called Sadducees is because they did not believe in the resurrection. So they were sad, you see. Made them very sad. I, if I didn't believe in the resurrection, I'd be sad. Wouldn't you? But I, I, one thing, I, the Bible tells me that that same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead one of these days is going to raise me. The reason why it's going to raise me, I can't talk for you now. I can talk for me. I can't talk for you. The reason why it's going to raise me is because I believe every word this Bible teaches me. And here's what I know. I know that I have accepted Lord Jesus Christ as my Savior. Did I understand it all when I first came into it? No, I did not. Has the Lord been leading me and opening my understanding? Yes, he has. But here's one thing I know. Hallelujah. I'm as good as in heaven already. The devil can't touch it. You know why? Because the word of God demands it. How did I get there? I placed my faith in the Son of God. Placed my faith in the Son of God. I wish I could open that term to you a little better. One of these days, God's gonna give me some utterance on that word, on the Son of God. I'm fixing to get happy. I don't want to, I don't, I don't want to kind of control myself if I can a little bit. There's power in the name of the Son of God. And the Lord wants you to understand what the Son of God means. Now I will put on another girl, modern intellects, thinks we're crazy. If you don't think so, turn the news on and listen to them. They'll tell you. I'm glad Jesus got me <laughs> before religious denomination got me. Did you catch that? I'm glad that Jesus got me before the world's intellectual got me. Get in a minute. So you see, he, he gave a, a harsh statement to these people, warning them. In other words, he's saying, you don't even belong to God. Who warns you, you vipers? See, Satan has always been looked at as a serpent. So you, know, you remember he took the form of a serpent in the Garden of Eden and he deceived and he was to crawl on his belly from there forth. And so see, you can write that. These were children of the devil. So he said, look what he said in verse eight. He's talking to these, he's talking to these. he said, bring forth therefore fruits, meat, for repentance. Bring forth fruit, meat. That word meat is axios in Greek language. And it, it means having the weight of another thing of like value. In other words, you need to bring forth something to show that you've repented. It also means it's befitting, it's, it's congruous, uh, corresponding to a thing. In other words, here's what, he's, here's what the word, here's what he's saying here. Bring forth or, or something, show me something that proves that you've repented. In other words, that you've turned and gone the other way. That's what he's telling these people. Now, Luke gives us a little more in-depth description of, the, of what happens when you repent. In Luke chapter three, verse 10, the Bible says, and the people ask him, saying, what shall we do then? In other words, they were, if I need to repent to bring forth 
what, kind, what do I need to do? And, and Jesus said, in, in verse 11, he said to them, if you got two coats, let him impart to him that hath none. And he that hath meat, let him do likewise. In other words, here's what Jesus said, if you wanna show your repentance, have turned to God, then you do it by, you do it, you love your neighbor as yourself. You do what you want people to do to you, you do to them. In other words, what we normally call we live right, we treat people right, we're honest we're, and we're straightforward, we help people, we have compassion for people. See, that's true repentance. And John told, told these people here, that's what you do. Then next came to him, he says, here comes the publicans. Now, the publicans was a tax collector. They, they work for the IRS. And you don't have a whole lot for the IRS people, I know, because they're in your pocketbook, aren't they? But here, here's what, the publicans came to be baptized. In other words, they weren't in on this kingdom of heaven too. And, and said, Master, what shall we do? And he said to them, here's what he said to them in verse 13, exact no more than that which is appointed to you. In other words, stop robbing the people, stop you being honest with them, whatever their honest taxes are, what you collect more than what you should. That just makes common sense, that's honest and sincere. And so there, that's what he told them to do. And then he said, and the soldiers, and, and the soldiers likewise demanded of him saying, and what shall we do? And he said to them, do violence to no man, neither accuse any falsely, and be content with your wages. So you can see from that view that what John is saying when it comes to repentance, here's something you can, this shows your repentance. Now a person who has not really changed their mind and turned their heart to God and letting the Lord Jesus Christ be their Lord, be their Savior, they will not have that kind of fruit in their life. There'll be other things showing in their life. There'll be greed and hostility and all those things will be showing up in their life. There will not be that sweet spirit of the Lord that's showing in their life. And also, uh, we, mentioned, we mentioned previously the, uh, the golden rule. Uh, Jesus said, uh, whatsoever ye would that men should do to you, do you even so to them, for this is the law and the prophets. In other words, if you want to understand what the law and the prophets are saying, you just treat people like you want to be treated. The wisdom of God to make that in such a short, concise statement. Here's another one, just to show you the wisdom of the Spirit of God. Love your neighbor as yourself. If you and I would love the neighbor as yourself, there would be no problems in this earth. There would be no trouble in this earth. There'd be no robbing and killing and things that we've seen. There would be none of that. If we could only, as a people, love your neighbor as yourself. Listen, God is love. And God expects his people, those who have repented, those who have come to him to express in their life is in a life expression of his love to others. I thank God that he finally convinced this old boy that there is a God in heaven who loves me, who died on the cross to pay my sin debt and helped me to see that I need to give my life to him so he can make of me what he wants to make. Because see, God is sovereign. First thing we have to understand when we come to God, we're coming to a God who is creator of heaven and earth. This universe, there's galaxy after galaxy in this universe. And God is even bigger than the universe because he flung it out there. That's more than your mind and my mind could comprehend. And that same spirit that put all that in place now is working with the little old country boy and drawing me closer to him and changing me into his likeness and making me want to be like him. And he has a place prepared for me in heaven that I can live with him and, and he, I'm, he's gonna be my master through all eternity. Boy, I tell you, Satan don't have anything like that to offer you. The Satan, oh, uh, he, the Satan came for this. He came to steal, kill, and destroy. And he's doing a good job of it. Jesus came that we might have life and have it, have it more abundantly. I wanna show you also, look at Romans 12, 17 through 19. It says recompense to no man evil for evil. See, this is giving you an idea of what repentance is. Provide things honest in the sight of all men. There's many a person in church today, not any by the way. There's people who are vipers and snakes just like the Bible said here. Said if it be possible as much within you, lies in you, live peaceable with all men. Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, 
but rather give place to wrath. For it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. Vengeance is mine, the Lord said. Whenever somebody wrongs you, you need to have a forgiving attitude and a forgiving heart and let, let, let the Lord deal with them. He knows more how to handle them and how to deal with them than you and I do. Every time I try to stand up and go into battle, I get in trouble. But buddy, whenever the Lord fights my battles, they get fought right. They, they're fought in the way they need to be fought and God, God handles it. You see, in the Christian baptism we do today, we baptize, but it's not exactly the same thing as John was baptizing. When John baptized, he baptized them in water. These Jewish people who had strayed away from God were saying, in, in, in essence they were saying, you know, I'm so far away from God, I'm just like a Gentile. And I really need to get right with God. I need to repent and come back to God. And so John would baptize them. In the, they were, it was like they were coming back to God through and confessing their sins. See. He said, the kingdom of God is at hand. It's like prepare, the prophecy said, to prepare the way of the Lord. Now, there was rough roads back then, but in certain cities, they would prepare a real smooth road for the king to come in on. That's where you get the term, the king's highway, because they would make a real smooth road for the king to ride in on. They would be a, 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 a crier, or a, what they call a herald to go out before. The king, the king is coming, the king is coming. People would understand well that whoever the king is in that particular province that is coming, they would they'd be excited looking for him. And you so you see, John here saying the, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Prepare the way of the Lord. Make his way straight. In other words, talking about filling in the valleys and leveling out the and make a way for him. And, and listen, in our heart, we have to have this old heart needs to be smoothed over for entrance for the King of Kings and Lord of Lords to come into our heart and life. There has to be repentance. There can be nothing less than repentance. I'm talking about true repentance. You see, look if you will in Ephesians 2, 8 through 10. Now, we love this passage right here. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. He says not of works in verse nine, not of works lest any man should boast. Now notice verse 10. Verse 10 says, for we are his workmanship. God has made us, created in Christ Jesus unto good works. So you can't separate good works from Christianity. You can't separate good works from repentance. If there's repentance and God's your creator and he's making you, there will be good works. The Bible says, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. We need to walk in those in, in the fact that we are God's workmen. That's why he moves up on us to do the thing. That's why you have the notion sometimes to help this individual, help that individual, speak to this person. It's good works that God has done. He's doing and he's doing it in and through you. Now notice also the last point I wanna make here in this message, the necessity for repentance. Notice the necessity for repentance. Notice with me in verse 10. John says, John the Baptist says this, and now also the ax is laid to the root of the trees. Therefore every tree which bringeth forth not good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. In verse 11 he says, I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance, but he that cometh after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. Verse 12 says, and whose fan is in his hand, he will thoroughly purge his floor and gather his wheat into the garner, but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. One thing I noticed, that the fire is gonna get us. Let me explain that. Let me explain that. Now, John here is given a long forecast. He's given down to the end, the, whenever all judgments is done, and God gathers everything in and separates and gets everything right, then, then then he's showing that he's gonna burn up the chaff, everything that's left over. He's gonna take those that are his out. See, he says, he's bringing it into the garner. That's like into the storehouse. Into, in, matter of fact, that word in the Greek is translated barn in several other passages of scripture. So you see, the prophecy here says that, that the Lord is gathering his people in. It says his fan is in his hand. It's like, like if you can see them sifting wheat or whatever, and they toss it up and then they fan it like that, and it kind of blows the shaft away. You see, the Holy Spirit is a searcher. Nothing will search your soul like the Holy Spirit will. 
that spotlight from heaven turns on, it'll see every flaw in you and it'll reveal it to you and give you the opportunity with your will to turn away from it, to walk away from it and not and don't, don't just choose to do it. You see, you see the, what, what I mean by the fire, it's either gonna be the fire of judgment or it's gonna be the fire that he fills us with the Holy Ghost and with fire. That fire is a pure fire. That's why Christian people live right. That's why Christian people do what's right. That's why Christian people treat their neighbors right. It's because of the fire of God that's burning in their spirit and helping them to see and help purify them and cleanse them. I'm telling you, if the fire of God's not burning in your life today and cleansing you, you need to understand what true repentance is. True repentance is turning away from the way you are and trusting who God is and then you're putting your soul trust in him. You're putting your soul trust in him. This morning, in conclusion, just let me ask this question. What is true repentance according to the scripture that we've looked at here today? And here it is. I've condensed it as much as I could. It is to agree with God about your sin. Confess your sin and turn from them. It's not just feel sorry about your sin. And you've got to trust that Jesus died to pay your sin debt. You see, there's something about how do I get rid of, see, Jesus died for sin 2,000 years ago. He died one time, paid for every sin that's ever been committed or ever will be committed. That's hard for us to wrap our brain around, but that's the truth of God's word. The sin that I may do tomorrow, I'm his child. I don't plan on sinning. But if I do, it's paid for. You say, Brother Bill, that's a life of the sin. No, it's not because I don't want to sin. I want, God, I want, I want to glorify my Father in heaven. But if I do, I'm just a saved. If I, if, I, if, if I'm just a saved anyway, because the blood of Jesus paid the sin debt for every man. The question is, have you repented of your sin? Have you turned to God, and have you yielded your life to Him and let Him make the change? Let Him make the new creature. We are new creatures in Christ Jesus. I don't know about you, but I'm not what I used to be. <laughs> I'm not what I'm going to be, but I thank God I'm not what I used to be. I can see myself shouting the praises of God around the throne in heaven by faith right now. You know why? Because I repented. Sin breaks my heart. I look at people's lives today and, and realize that, you know, oh, if they could only see Jesus. If they would only turn their life over to Jesus, if they'd only turn around and repent and turn to God, God could begin to heal and, and, and fix them. There's people who've been in church all their life that is so distraught, so troubled, so unstable. The reason why is because they've really not turned to God. They've turned to some religious idea. They're going through the motions. They're not really in Christ. In Christ is peace. In Christ is glory. In Christ, now everything don't go just like I wanted. I have trouble and problems, but we all do. Well, I tell you what, I have a help for my problems, don't you? Listen, Romans 10, 13, Paul says, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. I, I'm telling you, we have to know what true repentance is. I'm willing to lay it down. I'm willing to change my mind and turn and walk another way. Now, you don't have to do it like come in before, whenever you, whenever you make, whenever you change your mind and you agree with God, you don't have to be in church. Now, sometimes the, you know, some preachers will try to get a whole crowd so they can pat themselves on the back and put notches on their staff, whatever it is they do, and counting and all that. But you know, that's, that's silly. No, when a man changes his mind, he can be at home, he can be at work, he, he change, and he commits his life to the Lord Jesus Christ and he knows for sure that Jesus died to pay his sin debt. He can gloriously and marvelously be saved at that instant be changed into a new creature. Now the way we, in our society today, we do give invitation in church. But I want to tell you something, you're here this morning and the Lord's speaking to your heart. You might have been a Christian for a long time, but you've never repented. I want you to understand, true repentance is turning to God and away from your old self life and turning to Him and surrendering your life totally to God. Say, Brother Bill, do I have to come down front and confess all that? Not necessarily. But I want you to understand, 
what true repentance is. Jesus said, straight's the gate and narrow the way, and few there be that find it. One thing I want to know for sure is that I am one of the few. I am one of the few. And I pray that you are one of the few that has trusted the Lord Jesus Christ as Savior. Stand with me, if you will.